Are you ready to jump into another tutorial with me and Mario to complete another fun and exciting shader based off the rippled painting effect from Super Mario 64 or a water effect? If so, let's hop into this tutorial together. Let's -a go. Hello and welcome to another shader graph tutorial in 2019 we will be covering how to recreate the painting rippling effect you get when you jump into a level from Super Mario 64. Conveniently, this is also similar to a water rippling effect. Here is a preview of the nodes for those who don't want to watch the in-depth tutorial. This project will be using the universal render pipeline and the type of shader graph I'll be utilizing is the unlit graph. If you are unsure of how to set up your project to use URP, refer to my lava shader graph video up in the annotations or down in the description, what takes you step by step on how to set up a project and how to decide between which shader graphs to use. With the intro out of the way, let's open up our graph and dive in. To start, it is a good idea to break down our shader so we have an idea of what we really want to accomplish. We can see that only the painting itself has the effect applied to it. The effect uses the main texture of the object, the effect is relative to the object itself, and the origin of the rippling effect is based on where Mario enters the painting, and the effect is occurring over a certain amount of time. With this breakdown, we can now start tackling each feature. The best place for us to start is getting our object's fragment position and also using math to make it scalable for more control of our effect. We will create a position node and change the coordinate space to world. Now connect the output to a multiply node. Let's create a vector wood property in the blackboard, which I'll call scale and we'll set the default to one. Drag this property out and connect it to the other input of the multiply. To show what is actually going on here, I'm going to connect this to the UV input of a texture 2D sample node. You can see adjusting the default value of our scale property results in the image growing or shrinking. I will group these two nodes and call it get objects fragment position and scale effect. We now want to move on to controlling the origin point of our effect. The origin point will be important since that will help us set the point where the ripple effect will originate from. In the case of Super Mario 64, that would be the point where you jump into the painting. To achieve this effect, we need to take the output of our multiply and attach it to the input of a distance node. Next, let's create a vector4 property in the blackboard, which I'll call origin. Plug this property into the other input of our distance node. To try to explain what is going on here, we need to remember that our position node gave us the position of our fragments and has also determined our position information, which is relative to the world coordinates. So we use the distance node, which returns the Euclidean distance, aka the shortest distance between both inputs, which in our case, our fragment positions are being calculated against our origin point. This essentially is giving us a grayscale image that looks like a faded dot. I will group this node and call it set origin of effect. This next step will be starting the work of generating the ripple or ring shape of our effect. There are multiple ways of going about this, but the method I will show will allow you to generate the shape utilizing the grayscale image we already created. One of the easiest ways to get a ring shape is by utilizing the smooth step node. The smooth step node takes the input values and outputs interpolated values between zero and one, essentially giving us a gradient that we'll be able to control. Plug the output of our distance node into both of the imports of our smooth step nodes. The edge values are what we use to control the general shape of our ring. To help visualize what is going on here, you could temporarily swap out our position node with a screen position node since that gives us a better preview. I will keep this temporary node in the graph for now for further visualizations. Now that we have a better preview, we can adjust our smooth step edge values, which for the first node I had 0 for edge 1 and 0 0.3 for edge 2. For the second node I had 0 for edge 1 and 0 0.7 for edge 2. Finally, to get our shape, we will subtract the second smooth step node from the first smooth step node. The preview of our subtract node should now be a grayscale ring that has a gradient to it. Yahoo! I am going to group these three nodes together and label it generate ring shape. We now have a shape, so now we need to add some type of animation to it. 
To get the animation, we are going to look into creating a looping timer. If you have watched my previous tutorials, then you'll be familiar with a scrolling effect, which we'll be repurposing for this effect, but with some slight tweaks. We will start off by creating a time node and multiplying the time output by a vector one property. This will allow us to control the speed of our effect. We now want to get a, a looping effect where the timer will start at zero, go to one, and then reset back to zero. You may be asking why not use the sine or cosine time outputs to achieve this? And that is because those outputs go smoothly from zero to one, back to zero, AKA alternates between zero and one, like a wave function. Knowing we need to go from zero to one, then immediately back to zero, we can focus on another node. In this case, it'll be the fraction node. The fraction node simply takes the input value and spits out only the decimal portion of the number. The range will always fall between greater than or equal to zero and less than one. Some examples of this would be if we put in 1.57, the fraction output will be 0.57. And if we input 420.69, then the fraction output will be 0.69. With this, we plug our multiply into the input of a fraction node. Our looping timer is now complete. Group these nodes together and I'll label it looping timer. We have a timer and we have our initial ring shape, but now we need to combine these together. The way I'm going to do this is by adding our ring shape to our timer. The main gist of this is we have a grayscale image that is being washed out with our timer. Looking at the preview of our add node, you can see how we start with our shape and eventually the entire preview just turns white. You may also notice that there's a bit of a ripple effect inside of the preview. However, this is not a strong enough effect for me personally, so we need to fix that. There is a nifty way we can strengthen our ripple effect while at the same time adding more creative features to it. To achieve this, we'll be using the sample gradient node. This node takes two inputs, a gradient and time. This time input is a little misleading though. Time here just means which portion of the gradient to use. So in this example, we have a gradient that is black on the left and white on the right. If our time input value is zero, then it will sample the furthest left portion of our gradient, which is black. And if the time value is one, then it will sample the furthest right portion of our gradient, which is white. One thing this time input doesn't clearly tell you is if you input a grayscale image, it will use each fragment to determine which part of the gradient to sample from. So, in our ring shape, the whitest part will cause the node to sample the furthest right portion of our gradient, and the black portions of the ring will cause the node to sample from the furthest left portion of our gradient. Using this, we can create a unique gradient which has multiple changes from black to white, which will give our ring shape multiple rings of unique sizes. To help further the smooth transitions between our ripple effects, I will run the output of our sample gradient node into the import of a smooth step node. This just allows us to have a little further control of how our grayscale image will look. Let's group these three nodes together and I'll call it strengthen effect. This next step I'm about to show is technically not needed, but I personally think it looks better to show it. Our preview is already showing a fairly decent looking effect. However, I personally think inverting it will make it stand out a little more. Again, this step is not necessary. But anyways, to invert the effect, I'll be using the one minus node. All this node is doing is taking the input values and subtracting them from one. As an example, if a fragment was black, which has a value of zero is subtracted from one, the result is one, essentially changing that fragment from black to white. Now you can see how we use this to invert our effect. Group this node and I'll label it invert effect. With this, we have finished the basis of our ripple shape. Our next step will be adding depth to our effect. This may sound difficult, however, this is a fairly simple task using a node called normal from height. This node takes the input values and converts it to a normal map, which means it will use the RGB values to determine the normals, essentially telling Unity how to shade the object. This type of normal map is good for deformation of meshes, but for us, it will virtually act as a bump map, creating the illusion of depth. Feed the output of the one minus node into the input of a normal from height node. You'll notice a pull down option for output space. We want this value to be tangent. Group this node, which I will mark as create depth, 
our ripple effect is now animated with decent control on how the general shape looks with added depth to it. It is time for us to add this effect into our main texture. How do we add our cool looking ripple effect onto our game object? Well, since we know we are dealing with the fragment portion of our shader, we can narrow our options down. A good place for us to look is at the UV node. The UV node provides access to the mesh vertex or fragments UV coordinates. That last part sounds promising for us. If we create a UV node, you'll notice that it only has an output and no inputs. So how do we utilize the fragment UV positions? You can extrapolate or blend this information quite a few ways. However, for us, we'll be utilizing the add node. Feed the output of our UV node into an add node then take the output of our normal from height node and plug it into the other input port of our add node. This means we are now manipulating the fragments of our UV via our normal map. I am going to group the UV node and add node and call it alter UV. We only have a few steps left at this point. Our next milestone is to apply our altered UV to a texture to make it look like it is rippling. We'll be utilizing a technique that viewers of my previous videos should understand right away. We need to grab the main texture of the object our shader is applied to. Shader graph allows us to do that via the blackboard. Create a texture 2D property, which I'll call main text. And for the reference, it needs to be written exactly as this, underscore capital M A I N capital T E X. Now, when we sample this texture, Unity will know to grab whatever texture is applied to the object and use it in our effect. You can select a texture for this property, which just helps for visualization purposes. Drag this main text property out and attach it to the texture input of a sample texture 2D node. Now take that output of our add node and plug it into the UV input of our sample texture 2D node. You should see in the preview the effect starting to take place. I'll group this node and title it Use Main Texture. We can now plug the RGBA output of our sample texture 2D node into the color input of our master node. The last step is to replace our temporary screen position node with a position node to set object space so our effect works correctly. Save the asset. Now we can close out of our shader graph and set up our object in the scene. This part of the process is fairly simple. I just have an image of the Baum Battlefield painting from Super Mario 64, which can be easily found with a quick Google search. Just drag this in and we'll act as a sprite object. Give the object a box collider since we'll use it in it later. Make sure you created a material that is associated with the shader and apply that material to the sprite object. Depending on what your origin value is in the inspector, you should be able to see the effects starting to work right away. I could leave the tutorial right here, but I would like to show you how to use this effect like it is in Super Mario 64. This part of the tutorial is going to be covering how to use exposed properties from the blackboard of our shader and using them in a C-sharp script. The last goal I'm going to try to conquer is based on the mouse position. When I click it, it will set the origin point. This will cause a timer to start, which when the timer ends, our effect ends. This means we need to go back into our shader graph to do a little more setup. Let's take a look at our blackboard again. Expand our origin property and under the reference field, let's change that to underscore origin. You can name this whatever you want, but keep this simple. Next, we need to give a reference to the ripple speed property, which I'll just give underscore ripple speed. And also give the scale property a reference, which I'll give underscore scale. Lastly, we need to create a new vector one, which I'll call timer and give the reference underscore timer. Drag this timer property out into our graph. Since we want to control the timer via script now, we can get rid of all the nodes except the multiply node from our looping timer group. We want our timer property being multiplied by our ripple speed. Our timer property is essentially acting like the time node we had before. Also, since we are controlling the timing via script, we no longer need the fraction node to repeat our effect. Make sure the output of our multiply is going into the input of our add node in the strengthen effect group. This wraps up all the shader changes we need to make. So let's get on with the scripting. 
I will assume that you already have a general idea of how to code or how to look up code bits that you don't fully understand. The main areas I will focus on in the script is the actual implementation of the getting and setting of our shader properties. I will show in my code in its entirety, which will have comments to explain further what is going on. With that little disclaimer out of the way, let's get into the code. So create a new c -sharp script and open it up in your preferred editor. Let's take a look at the script now. You can see here that I have three private variables. The first is a material variable which we'll be using to store the material of the object that we click on. The second variable is a boolean which we will be using for our animation timer. And the third variable is a float which will store the result of our math of determining how long our animation will play. The next portion is our update function. I create a check to see if our left mouse button is clicked and if our boolean is false. If it is, then our method change origin position will run. Let's take a look at what this method does. You'll see that we create a local vector3 variable, which we just store the mouse position. Then we create a local ray variable. This will be used for our casting point of our ray. Next is a raycast hit variable, which is a structure that will be used to store multiple pieces of information from our raycast. This next part is the actual raycast method, which needs a origin point, a structure to pass info to, and a distance of how far the ray will go. If our raycast detects an object, it will set our boolean to true. Store the information of the detected object into our material variable, and now the interesting part of the script. We want to get the value of our scale property that we used in our shader, and the way we do that is using the dot get function. In this case, you can see I have a local float variable called scale, which I set to the material dot get float with parentheses, quotation marks, underscore scale. This is checking our stored material and checking to see if it has a property by the name inside the quotation marks. That is why giving a clear and simple reference in the blackboard was so important. The script then goes on to creating a new local vector three variable, which is taking the hit dot point aka the position our ray hit our game object and multiplying it by our scale variable. The reason we do this is our scale actually affects objects a local scale. As an example, if our scale was 2, that means we need our position to be 2 times the distance it currently is to match. The next step is another crucial element of this process. We know how to get a property, but how do we set them? Well, in this script, you can see we call our material and do a dot set vector, parentheses, quotation marks, underscore origin. Then you see our local vector three that stores our scaled position being passed into the argument. This is just sending the value we calculated into our shader's property and setting it via the reference name we gave. If you are using IntelliSense or other similar coding editors, you'll notice that there are other forms of dot gets and dot sets. So knowing what type of value your property is makes it important to get the syntax correct. Back to the code, you'll see now that our origin is set and a coroutine is called the start. This is our timer loop function used for our animation. The first thing we do is set our shader property timer to zero since that is the beginning of our animation. Next, we store our ripple speed property value and our timer value in local variables. We then store the result of some math into our private global float variable. All this math is doing is taking one divided by our ripple speed. You can essentially think of this as one cycle divided by our speed, which then would spit out how long our cycle time should be. The example shown is one cycle divided by our ripple speed of 0.2, which results in an animation of five seconds. Now that we have a timer variable and a value to compare it against, we just use a while loop to act as a timer and each frame the loop runs, it will set our shader's timer value to the new value. This is acting very similar to the time node we started with, just converted in the script, which allows us more control. After the loop finishes, our boolean is set back to false so we can start the process all over again. Now that we're done with the script and we're back in Unity, let's take a look at the inspector of our object. Go to the shader portion, and I'm going to change the scale to something a little smaller than one. So let's go 0.5. And then for the origin, let's just leave it at 0, 0, 0. And ripple speed, I'll leave at 0.2. 
So this is a pretty good setup. I have to make sure the box collider is on this object. That's the only, only way that our Raycast will work. And then also we need to make sure our script is in the scene somewhere. So you can attach the script either to the object or you can attach it to your camera. It doesn't matter where the script is because it's gonna work no matter what. So with the script attached to whatever object, let's play the video. And now when we click on the scene, clicking out in the black area does nothing. But if I click on the actual image, you can see the origin being set to the new point where I click and then the ripple effect goes and then it plays for the entire duration of the animation time or the total time of effect. So with that, that is how you essentially could get this effect to work as if it was like Super Mario. All you'd have to do is detect where Mario jumped, hit the painting, and then there you go, you would have the full effect. I really do hope you enjoy and learn from these videos. If you do, consider subscribing to the channel and also giving the video a like. There's other videos similar to this on the channel, kind of going over lava shader effects, matrix training code effects, and maybe even a distortion or two. So with that being said, I hope you take care and be safe. Let's go!